fans and viewers of the ACNS webinars. We are back again this week with a brand new episode of the educational webinars for you. There are two amazing speakers today who are going to teach us about their respective subspecialities. The first topic for today is interoperative monitoring and mapping of neural function. As you all know that neuromonitoring has become a standard of care in neurosurgery. And you might have come across several instances where you might have had to change your plans depending upon the alterations in the neuromonitoring. To teach us more about the technical nuances of neuromonitoring, we are joined by one of the very learned professors from Japan, Professor Oton Endo. Professor Endo is the head of Department of Neurosurgery, the Aichi Prefectural Federation of Agriculture Cooperatives for Health and Welfare, Kainan Hospital. Professor Endo was a previous faculty at Nagoya University and he's an integral part of the Japanese Neurosurgical Association. We are extremely thankful to him to have accepted our invitation to be a speaker at the ACNS webinars today. To chair this very interesting lecture, we are honored by the presence of a giant in neurophysiological monitoring, Professor Francisco Sala from Italy. Professor Sala is a professor and chair of neurosurgery at the University of Verona, Italy. His main clinical and research interests are pediatric neurosurgery and intraoperative neurophysiology. Professor Sala is one of the co-founders of the International Society of Interoperative Neurophysiology, where he has served as a secretary, the chairman of the education committee, as well as the president from 2013 to 15. Professor Sala is particularly committed to the training of young neurosurgeons and development of interoperative neurophysiology in, in the global surgical communities. He is an integral part of the EANS and is also on the executive, executive board of the same. In 2016, he was appointed as the first chair of the Neuromonitoring Committee of the WFNS. We are extremely thankful to Professor Sala for having accepted our invitation to chair this session of ACNS webinars. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I sincerely welcome today's speakers, Professor Otono Endo and Professor Francisco Sala, to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I please hand over this platform to Professor Salah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuti. Uh, and thanks again for this uh, invitation. I'm very pleased and honored to be here and to contribute to your uh, uh, ACNS webinars. Uh, I would like to thank also Professor Kato for his uh, kind invitation. Um, as you said, neuromonitoring is, uh, is not, not anymore an emerging discipline because we have been uh, involved in this field for the past 20 years, but to some extent continues to be controversial. Of course, there are many ways of monitoring. There are many mapping and monitoring techniques. Um, we have very good evidence that monitoring, monitoring can uh, um, predict neurological outcome in many different areas of neurosurgery, spinal cord surgery, brainstem, brain tumor surgery. There is less evidence according to the standard evidence-based medicine criteria that monitoring can prevent a neurological injury. So a lot have been published over the past 20 years in this area. Um, I continue to believe that monitoring not just predict, but also prevent injury or at least minimize morbidity in many cases. We certainly need better evidence, but we have to continue to develop also innovative techniques. So I'm very glad that uh, Professor, Professor Endo will address this topic. He will uh, talk about the uh, values and limitations of interoperative neuromonitoring. I look very much forward to his lecture and then I'm sure we will have a fruitful discussion at the end. So you have already beautifully introduced him. I will just pass now the floor to Professor Hendo. Professor Hendo, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, for your polite uh, introduction. Uh, I've been very much looking forward to uh, today's lecture. My name is Otone Hendo from Nagoya, Japan. Today, I'll give you a brief lecture about the interoperative monitoring and mapping of neural function, emphasizing its efficacy and limitations. <clears throat> Since delicate and careful operation is required in neurosurgery, trivial events can lead to serious complications. There are various interoperative monitoring and mappings to prevent complications, but their limitations need to be noted. Then, what is monitoring? Monitoring means continuous or intermittent evaluation of quantified and visualized biological status. 
electrocardiography, blood oxygen saturation, blood pressure, and body temperature are also kinds of monitoring. Monitoring of neural function and cerebral blood flow are required in neurosurgery. In awake surgery, we can evaluate patient status by manual muscle test, sensory test, and composition. Unconscious general anesthesia requires monitoring of motor cortex and motor, sensory, and other functions, and cerebral blood flow. So we need electrophysiological monitoring using evoked potentials. What is mapping? Mapping means functional localization clarified for precise neurosurgery. Mapping evaluates functions spatially, not in time course. For example, functional localization on the cerebral cortex and brainstem surface and the identification of subcortical running sites of axons in the white matter. Mapping is realized by visualizing the presence or absence of functional functions by electrical stimulation. Types of monitoring are as follows. SEP, somatosensory evoked potentials, BAEP or ABR, uh, brainstem auditory evoked potentials or auditory brainstem response. CNAP, cochlear nerve action potentials, BEP, visual evoked potentials, are used for sensory function. MEP, motor evoked potentials, including sub subdural MEP, transcranial MEP, and facial MEP. DOA, motor evoked spinal cord potentials, NIM, cranial nerve monitor for cranial nerves from 3rd to 12th, AMR, abnormal muscle response, BCR, valvocarbinosis reflex, are applied for motor function. EEG, Interoperative electroencephalography reflects general brain function. ECOG, interoperative electrocardiography, indicates local brain function. CCEP or CCEP, corticocortical evoked potential, brings the information about language related fibers. NIRS, in vivo near infrared optical spectroscopy and a stamp pressure shows the status of cerebral blood flow. Types of mapping includes awake cortical mapping and subcortical mapping for language and motor function, and false ventricle flow mapping for cranial nerves. Then, let's look at each suitable monitoring and mapping in various surgery. For supratentorial tumor, subdural MEP, BEP, awake cortical mapping and subcortical mapping are used to detect disorders of motor, visual, and language function, and to judge whether tumor is resectable or not. For infratentorial tumor, transcranial MEP, facial MEP, BAEP, NIM, and false ventricle flow mapping are implemented to detect disorders of auditory, facial motor, swallowing, and brainstem function, and to judge whether tumor is resectable and incision site is appropriate or not. For spinal tumor, transcranial MEP, D-wave, BCR can be applied to detect disorders of motor function. 
in microvascular decompression against hemifacial spasm, BAP, CNAP, AMR are applied to detect disorders of the cochlear nerve and to confirm disappearance of abnormal facial muscle response. In aneurysmal clipping, subdural MAP, transcranial MAP, SEP are inevitable to detect disorders of peripheral branches and apparatus around aneurysm. And in candid endoderectomy, CA, multimodal monitoring with transcranial MVP, SCP, EEG, and IRS, and star pressure are used to detect cerebral ischemia. Now, let me explain about electrical stimulation and nerve conduction. As Kenya shows, the inside of a neuron, including dendrites and axon, is charged negatively and outside positively at rest. By touching electrodes, the electrical charge inverts just beneath the cathode and a depolarization occurs. On the other hand, cell membrane becomes hyperpolarized beneath the anode. Electrical current travels away from the castle, but its conduction is blocked under the anode because it is neutralized by hyperpolarization. This phenomenon is called anodal block or conduction block. So, cranial nerves and subcortical fibers should be stimulated by castle. That is cathodal stimulation. On the contrary, cerebral cortex can be stimulated by a node. Since firing threshold is lower at the axon base than the dendrites, and conduction block does not occur because it does not cause hyperpolarization. <laughs> Let me briefly mention anesthesia. Since hemofluorin affects nervous transmission, declining amplitude, propofol is preferable. This level 50 to 70 is required for good MAP monitoring. Fentanyl and rainfentanyl does not affect MAP. Muscle relaxants should not be used during MP, MEP monitoring, but, uh, but it may be used on anesthesia induction. Then, I'm going to show you efficacy and the limitations of each monitoring and mapping. Efficacy is displayed in red letters and the limitations is written in blue letters. Let's start with SCP. Peripheral nerve is stimulated and SCP is recorded by subdural or transcranial electrode. Median nerve, uh, median nerve induces N20 and posterior tibial nerve induces N42. N means negative, that is upward weight, and P means positive, downward way. Following the number presents the peak latency milliseconds. SCP is easily derived and sensitive to hemispherical ischemia, but does not match its severity. SCP can also be used to, for central sulcus identification by detecting phase reversal of N20 on sensory cortex and P20 on motor cortex. This feature illustrates the area around the central circles. Uh, area 4, 3A, 3B, 1, 2 are here. The large potential induced in area 3B of sensory cortex 
is the origin of N20 and P20. On identifying central surface by SCP with subdural electrode, there is one thing to note. On the sensor cortex, P25 appears closer to the vertex than M20. And if, and, and if this P25 is uh, misidentified as P20, it causes disorientation. In that figure, electrode number one is on M20 and number two is on P20. Thus, central sulcus is estimated to lie between electrode number one and two correctly. But in the right figure, Electro, uh, electrode number one is covering P25 and number two covering N20. In this situation, side of the direction of central sulcus can mistakenly be estimated. Waveform and latency have to be identified carefully. <laughs> Function is evaluated by MVP. Subdural MVP accurately reflects motor function since motor cortex is directly stimulated by cerebral surface four channel electrode. But the procedure to place the electrode appropriately is complicated and it is difficult to derive subdural MVP depending on the craniotomy location. Transcranial MEP uses scalp corkscrew electrodes. Procedure is simple and the derivation rate is high. But there can be a false negative when the deeper part of the brain is stimulated than the, than the damaged region by high voltage. When the brain sinks as cerebral spinal flux flows out, higher voltage may be required as the impedance rises. Therefore, a false negative is likely to occur. MAP keenly detects ischemia of the motor cortex and corticospinal tract. MAP decline is co correlated with postoperative paralysis. But there is no correlation between the degree of MAP decline and the degree of paralysis. MAP tends to decline within one minute in perforated area and within 10 minutes in main arteries area. If MAP has recovered in the operation, the postoperative paralysis will eventually recover. Main artery ischemia may cause temporary increase in amplitude of MAP. This phenomenon is thought to be brought about by the, the, the inhibitor system of the basal ganglia is impaired by ischemia. So, amplitude increase of MAP should also be perceived as a warning sign. ICG administration may cause transient decrease of MAP. It is, of course, nothing to do with ischemia. I will display anatomical index of MAP and SAP electrodes. Virtual central sulcus lies on the line from 2 cm posterior of CZ to mandibular angle. Semicolonal dotted line on the left tibia. Subdural MAP electrode should be placed covering MUE point for upper extremities 5 cm lateral from the midline on the virtual central sulcus line and MLA point for lower extremities, two centimeters lateral from the midline. Transcranial MEP corkscrew electrodes are normally set at C3 and C4 as illustrated on the right figure, MTC. 
When C3, C4 is used for EEG, transcranial MEP electrodes are placed at seven centimeters lateral from CZ to external meters instead, C3 prime and C4 prime. Transcranial SCP electrode is set at two centimeters posterior from the points that are seven centimeters lateral from CZ to external meters for medial nerve and two centimeters for posterior tibial nerve, SUE and SLE. In case of frontal craniotomy for ACOM A and ACA aneurysms, interhemispheric four channel electrode can be inserted along paths. If insertion is impossible due to falsial adhesion, operculum electrodes should be inserted from another additional dural incision as a right figure. This subdural MEP target point for upper extremities differs from those of many textbooks. Specifically, about two centimeters media from instructions written on those documents. But the study shows it is a suitable point for more reliable derivation for subdural MEP. Facial MAP confirms facial nerve preservation during surgery. Even if the facial nerve cannot be detected by NIM, functional preservation can be confirmed by facial MAP. There can be a false negative due to gliding current from the electrodes to facial muscles. We should place stimulating electrodes on the facial motor cortex as accurately as possible to minimum, uh, minimize stimulation current. For facial MAP, corkscrew electrode should be placed at the one to two internal division point of C44, MFC, for a node, and five centimeters lateral from C0 to C3, MFC for cathode. In other words, MFC is 8 to 7 internal division point of CZ and preauricular point. MEP and SEP evaluation and stimulation conditions are as follows. <clears throat> D-wave is transcranially stimulated and recorded on the spinal cord. D-wave is not affected by anesthesia as it does not exceed snaps. Not affected by muscle relaxants, no false negative like transcranial MEP, and correlates with the degree of paralysis. Of course, it is difficult to derive extended post spinal cord surgery. It is considered safe if the amplitude is maintained at 70% or higher. Severe paralysis is inevitable in case amplitude declines less than 50%. Memory cause response to the innervated muscle by direct stimulation of the cranial nerves. Each cranial nerve can be evaluated individually. Evaluation is limited only for more uh, motor cranial nerves. Even if a nerve is damaged, distal stimulation will derive normal response. Typical electrode placement location is as this picture. 
lower muscle response is recorded as the innervated muscle that should not respond. When AMR disappears, it is judged that the surgery is effective. But surgery is not necessarily ineffective if it does not disappear, since in some cases, it may take time for AMR to disappear. Electrodes are installed like this. BAP, ABR, is recorded on the scalp electrode by quick sound stimulation. BAP uh, sensitively detects hearing impairment and indirectly detects brainstem dysfunction. Preoperative hearing impairment uh, disturbs accurate evaluation. 1,000 to 2,000 times accumulation is required for only 10 milliseconds analysis. Prolonged latency of this wave over 1 millisecond recommends alteration of brain spatula. Over 1.5 milliseconds prolonged latency or declined amplitude less than 50% requires spatula removal and wait for recovery. Each element of BAP comes from, right, uh, comes from this tissue. First, cochlear nerve. Second, cochlear nucleus. Third, superior olive. Fourth, lateral lemniscus. Fifth, inferior colliculus. Sixth, intergenic late body. Seventh, acoustic radiation and auditory cortex. BAEP waveform looks like this. Fixed wave is highest. BEP is recorded on the occipital scope by photic stimulation on the eyelids with LED. BEP detects optic nerve and visual tract disorders. BEP is evaluated by the amplitude between peaks of M75 and P100. Crossing and epsilateral fibers can be evaluated respectively. Intraoperative over 50% amplitude maintenance results in visual recovery. Preoperative visual impairment disturbs accurate evaluation. Appropriate stimulation depends on the ocular direction. Quadrantanopia is difficult to detect. EEG is evaluated by waveform and frequency spectrum analysis derived from two or more electrodes, such as C3 and C4, or F3 and F4. Since EEG slowing and declining amplitude detects general brain dysfunction, it is suitable for detection of severe hemispheric ischemia. EEG is sensitive to noise and cannot evaluate specific brain function. CCEP or CCEP is applied for dominant hemisphere. 16 channel grid electrode is placed on both frontal lobe, area 44, 45, and 46, and temporal lobe, area 20, uh, 22, and posterior. CCEP is evaluated by detective N1, N2, 50 milliseconds, and N2. 50 to 300 milliseconds, which confirms axonal connection between Broca's area 
and welding is the area. It is not necessarily a confirmation of language function preservation. CCF is troublesome to derive due to many channel combinations. NYRS measures cerebral surface regional blood flow oxygen saturation with bilateral fluid flow. It clearly detects cerebral ischemia by changes in regional oxygen saturation. Minus 20% decrease indicates significant hemispherical ischemia. In calculated endoarthrectomy, Interoperative patterns of change predicts postoperative hyperperfusion. perfusion. Left right reversal of regional oxygen saturation after developing internal cavity artery correlates with preoperative decreased cerebral vascular reserve and suggests postoperative hyperperfusion. The regional oxygen saturation value is relative and it cannot be evaluated as absolute value. The regional oxygen saturation value can be improved by raising blood pressure. Less than minus 30% decrease does not correlate with ischemic sequelae. Accurate evaluation is hindered if the frontal sinus has large laterality. The upper figure shows uh, the principle of NIRS. In lower figure, this patient's pattern shows transient reversal of regional oxygen saturation. Proximal stand pressure of the internal carotid artery and the obliteration of CCA and ECA. It is one of standard to judge necessity of inserting internal shunt during CDA. But there are individual differences in ischemic tolerance. Here is an example of interoperative monitoring of CDA. One, when stop pressure is less than 20 millimeters H2O, consider using internal shunt. Two, when regional oxygen saturation declines, raise the systolic pressure in the range of 120 to 160. Try to keep the decrease rate less than minus 20%. Use internal shunt when regional oxygen saturation decline is minus 30% or more. Three, even when SCP declines, Surgical procedure may be continued as far as MAP and EEG are unchanged. But preparation for internal shunt is recommended. Four, when MAP declines, an expert may continue surgical procedure in a hurry, but a beginner needs internal shunt insertion. However, internal shunt is of no use against embolism. Five, when EEG slows down or presents low amplitude, internal shunt should be inserted unless the time to complete the procedure and recanalize blood flow is expected to be shorter than the time to open the shunt. In a way, cortical mapping, Cerebral surface is stimulated with Ogerman's cortical stimulator or grid electrode and evaluated by motor and language task. For motor function, presenter gyrus, supplementary motor area, and premotor area are stimulated. For higher brain function, such as language, calculation, abraxia, agnosia, inferior frontal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus, angular, and the supermarginal gyrus are selected. 
A very political mapping is helpful to judge whether the tumor is resectable or not. Good control of anesthesia, collaboration with biomedical technicians, speech therapists, and nurses, firm relationship with patients are indispensable to accomplish successful awake surgery. EcoG is recorded at the same time to detect after discharge to avoid seizure. Cooling cerebral surface with chilled sea line is effective. Subcortical mapping for pyramidal tract is possible under general anesthesia. White matter stimulation induces evolved potential on the extremities and evaluates the running of motor related fibers. Distance to pyramidal tract millimeter is nearly equal to threshold stimulation current milliampere, but the accurate distance is not different. Electrode insertion to white matter might cause cerebral injury. Subcortical mapping for higher brain function is performed under awake surgery. Association fibers and arcuate fibers are evaluated by language test. When certain dysfunction is induced by subcortical stimulation, Related fibers exist there in the vicinity. Not all fibers can be evaluated. Away cortical mappings and symptoms are as follows. Broca's area, language dysfunction related with motor aphasia. Well, in the area and supramarginal gyrus, sensory aphasia and anexia. <coughs> Angular gyrus, acalculia, agraphia, left right agnosia, finger agnosia, known as Gerstmann syndrome. For understanding of a metaphor, ideational apraxia. Idiomotor apraxia, construction, constructional apraxia, and out of body experience. Awake subcortical mappings and symptoms are as follows Arcuate fasciculus, speech repetition disturbance, those lateral prefrontal cortex, working memory failure. Frontal Aslan tract, phonological change, stuttering and loss of fluency, impaired smooth motor function. <coughs> Dorsal superior longitudinal fasciculus, idiomotor apraxia. Frontal striatal tract, impaired smooth motor function. Abnormal eye movement. Frontal eye field, abnormal eye movement. This is map of Rodman area. And this is map of uh, fasciculus. Post ventricular floor mapping is performed by stimulating the floor and recording as the innervated muscle as well as skin. Mapping identifies the location of the nerve, nerve nucleus and the running of fibers. It is difficult to stimulate specific nerve nucleus with optimal current. Mapping can only be used as a guide to approach safety zone. Location of major nuclei. This is the final slide. Summary. Suitable monitoring and mapping differs in every disease and surgery. 
We have to understand the efficacy and limitations of each monitoring and mapping to, uh, to apply interoperatively. We should endeavor to reduce the risk of complications by combining multiple monitorings and mappings. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Endo, for your you. very comprehensive lecture. I think you have touched almost every mm -hmm. core of intraoperative neural monitoring, uh, emphasizing yes. the value and the limitation of, of each technique. Um, so I have a few comments, but um, I wonder if we should first take questions from the participants. Uh, there we any can hear your comments. Again, we can hear your short comments before we go into the speaker, next speaker who has arrived. Okay, so uh, no questions from the, the floor from the participants. We will reserve the questions for you at the end. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, just a few comments. Uh, I mean, you know, it, it was a very comprehensive lecture, so you, you touch base on, on many different topics. Um, I think there is no doubt that we still have limitation in, in various intraoperative neural monitoring techniques. Just touching very quickly on a few that you mentioned. Uh, I think phase reversal with the SCPs uh, was very valuable in the past to localize the central sulfur, therefore indirectly the primary motor cortex. It's still a valuable technique nowadays, although probably with all the pre- uh, surgical functional mapping that we have nowadays with TMS, uh, fMRI, DTI, etc. Uh, the, the, the relevance of phase reversal has probably decreased. It's still uh, uh, quite valuable, I think, in children where sometimes it's difficult to get uh, motor evoke potential directly from cortical stimulation. Um, no doubt that uh, transcranial MEP is exposed to the risk of false negative. So I always recommend to use cortical MEP whenever feasible. Uh, in most cases, of course, at least for, for brain tumor surgery or vascular surgery, it's always possible to insert a strip uh, subcortically, even though the, even in cases where the primary motor cortex is not exposed. So to use cortical rather than transcranial MEP is, is always better because the risk of bypassing the level of the uh, surgery and therefore the risk of false negative response is much lower. So uh, I would definitely uh, emphasize the importance of, of using cortical rather than transcranial MEP for brain surgery. Um, uh, of course, for facial MEPs in uh, uh, vestibular schwannoma surgery or in posterior fossa surgery, as for the other cortico uh, motor evoke potential, there is the risk of false negative because as Professor Endo uh, pointed out, you may end up activating the peripheral nerve rather than the cortico pathway. One trick which can be of help is to repeat the stimulation with just a single stimulus anytime we have the response with a train of stimuli. And the reason is that with a single stimulus, uh, you, we are not supposed to have a muscle response because under general anesthesia, this single stimulus is supposed to be blocked by at the synaptic level. So when you, we have a nice uh, facial response, we're using a train of stimuli, it's always useful to repeat the stimulation with just a single stimulus. If we still have a response, most likely this is a peripheral response. So we cannot trust this for a continuous monitoring. Um, D-Wave is, uh, to me, it should be the gold standard for spinal cord tumor surgery because it has the strongest prognostic value for long-term motor outcome. Um, we have to learn a lot from our Japanese colleagues in terms of using the D-Wave for brain tumor surgery, which is something that in the US and in Europe, we never did. But there is no doubt that the D-Wave is the strongest, uh, uh, it's the best technique to specifically monitor the cortical spinal tract. So uh, although it's, it's an invasive technique, but the possibility to place a percutaneous electrode for D wave monitoring also in brain tumor surgery will hopefully open new perspective in terms of having very reliable technique for MEP for motor outcome also in brain tumor surgery, better than we have nowadays with the 
and muscle MEPs. Uh, for the VEP, we have abandoned visual above potential for many years because they were considered less reliable. I think now with improving in your anesthesia, this has in, improved a lot, and especially with the use of the combined retinogram. So using retinogram, we can make sure that we are really delivering the stimulus to the retina. This has also contributed to improve the reliability of VEPs. And just a final comment on, on the future of neuromonitoring. I think that cortico-cortical evoke potential are definitely what, one of the may, most important field of investigations nowadays not just for the arcuate fasciculus, but also for other white matter tracts. And this might be in the future open also the possibility to at least monitor some pathway uh, of related to cognitive function like language, also in patients where it's not possible to perform the surgery awake. Uh, so this is certainly uh, fascinating as it is fascinating the use of neuromonitoring as a kind of neuromodulation to uh, increase the possibility of inducing neuroplasticity, especially in the surgery of low-grade gliomas. So just to, to wrap it up, I think that you know, neuromonitoring remains a fascinating field. There is no doubt we need to improve some techniques. We need to prove the evidence also for preventing the injury. But in general, if you look at the literature, the evidence there is in the field of neuromonitoring is in no way less than the evidence there is in the field of neurosurgery. Many things we do as neurosurgeons are not supported by strong evidence-based medicine criteria, but still are considered the standard of care in our practice. So in general, the evidence we have for the benefit of monitoring is the same evidence we have for the benefit of neurosurgery. And uh, I would like just to thank Professor Endo again for his very nice comprehensive lecture. And uh, I pass it back to you, uh, Dr. Kuti. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Endo. Thank you very much. We are so indebted to you for coming here and teaching us the technical nuances of intraoperative neuromonitoring. I understand our honored uh, speaker has an important surgery and he will be leaving soon. So on behalf of the Education Committee and the President of Yokogata, I sincerely thank you for coming here and teaching us so elaborately about intraoperative neuromonitoring. Thank you so much, Professor Endo. Thank the, you. Yeah. So in the meanwhile, we are joined by our second speaker, Professor Nader Senai from Baron Neurological Institute and our chair is Professor Nasser El Gandur from Cairo University, Egypt. I'll just say a few words about our speaker and the chairs. Welcome both the speaker and chair. The second speaker for today is our distinguished faculty from Baron Neurological Institute, Phoenix, Arizona, Professor Nader Sanai. Professor Sanai is a JN Harbor Professor of Neurological Surgery and holds the Francis and Diona Najafi Chair in Neurosurgical Oncology at the BNI. As an internationally recognized brain tumor surgeon, his clinical practice is devoted entirely to the patients suffering with benign and malignant brain tumors, particularly those in the high-risk areas. He is a world expert in using brain mapping techniques to identify and preserve areas of motor, sensory, and language function during surgery. As one of the America's highest volume neurosurgical oncologists, Dr. Sanai was elected in 2016 as the youngest member of the ANS, the most respected academic organization in neurosurgery. As the director of IV Brain Tumor Center, Dr. Sanai oversees all brain tumor research at Bar Neurological Institute. Dr. Sanai is one of the only handful of neurosurgeons in the nation serving as principal investigator for multiple NIH R01 grants. Collectively, Dr. Sanai's published research has led to over 15,000 total citation and an H index of 47, one of the highest of an academic neurosurgeon in the, in the US. Professor Sanai, we are extremely honored by your presence among us today, and we are sincerely grateful to you for having accepted our invitation to speak at our webinars. The chair for this session of webinar is our very learned and widely experienced surgeon from Egypt, Professor Nasser Al-Gandur. Professor Al-Gandur is a professor of neurosurgery, Cairo University, Egypt. 
He is the current president of the Egyptian Society of Neurological Surgeons and the current general secretary of the Continental African Association of Neurosurgical Societies. He is also the current vice president of the WFNS at large. He has presented many talks in international meetings, published several articles, and has authored five book chapters. His contributions to the training of education of many young neurosurgeons through organizing many courses and hands-on workshops is really commendable. We are so fortunate that he has joined us to chair this webinar. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to Professor Al Thank you very much, uh, Professor Raja, for this uh, kind introduction. I would like to thank the Asian Congress of Neurosurgery for this kind invitation. And actually, I am honored to be the chairman of this session, this important event about a very important subject, which is surgical treatment of gliomas which is uh, the most common primary brain tumor. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, 30 years ago when I was uh, making registration for my PhD degree in Cairo University, my mentor at such time suggested for me the topic of surgical treatment of gliomas to be the title of the PhD degree. And it was very interesting topic for me. And within three years, we were able to operate on 500 patients because we have a very good flow of these patients in our institute, which is Cairo University School of Medicine or Qasr El Aini Hospitals. And I remember what my mentor told me at such time at the end of the thesis that we can add life to days, but we cannot add days to life. And I realized from such time that the most important mission while dealing with these patients is to keep them neurologically intact after operation, the same like before operation without developing new deficits. And that is actually a very important target while operating on these patients. And until now, after 30 years have passed, it is very interesting to know what did we achieve in the surgical treatment of gliomas. The, prog the progression of technology is very fast and definitely it has a good impact on the results of outcome. And this is what we need to know. And we need to know about uh, the high glade gliomas. Uh, there are different strategies existing among different centers all over the world. Some neurosurgeons like to remove the lesion totally or gross totally. Others like to do biopsy and adjuvant therapy. What's the best protocol of treatment of glioblastoma multiform? That's very important. Uh, we have to know a lot of questions. Uh, is uh, there uh, any improvements in the adjuvant therapy? And uh, does the extent of surgical removal has an impact on the surgical outcome? Were we able to extend the survival time of these patients after 30 years with all this technology and all this improvement and advancement in everything? How can we decrease the incidence of recurrence? And what about the future? What we are expecting in the future? The research in the methods of surgical treatment or adjuvant therapy. And about low-grade glioma, I think that's more challenging because some of these patients are curable if they, if they take the best chance in treatment. We have a lot of advancement, awake craniotomy. We have, uh, we have uh, fluorescein uh, guided surgery. We have laser thermal therapy. We have uh, we, we are able now to excise uh, low-grade glioma totally from eloquent brain areas like brain uh, that like uh, like uh, Broca's area. We have the the technology of brain mapping. This is what we need to know, and uh, we are very interested and eager to listen to our next speaker, Professor Nader Sanai, to give us more information about the surgical treatment of low-grade and high-grade gliomas and how it's possible to maximize the extent of resection and having the best outcome while treating these patients. Thank you very much.
May I introduce our next speaker, Professor Nader Sanai. Well, thanks very much, Professor. Um, I certainly agree with all of your sentiments in that introduction. Um, and there is definitely a long way to go for this disease. Uh, I was asked to speak on the surgical strategies and decision-making surrounding low and high-grade gliomas. Uh, let me start by emphasizing that surgical strategies regarding gliomas begin with decision-making, as uh, Professor El Gandor alluded to. It's not about simply target practice and removing a lesion. It is about knowing when to remove the lesion and how to preserve quality of life when doing that. For low-grade gliomas and for high-grade gliomas, the, the data that exists is differs. And I think any glioma surgeon needs to be familiar with this data in order to not only explain to our patients why we're taking certain actions, but also to understand when we should and should not take those actions. For many years, as many of us know, low-grade gliomas were not tumors that were initially resected. They were watched and then as evidence of progression or transformation, they were resected. And this has been a paradigm shift over the last 10, 15 years, largely due to studies like this, where in the absence of randomization, there have been these controlled cohort studies where you have two hospitals, for example, with different practices with respect to low-grade glioma management. One group initially operated on the patient, one group just biopsied and waited. And the data is quite clear that for any patient with a suspected low-grade glioma, the early intervention favors the patient. And so in this respect, there really isn't much role for most patients in watching and waiting a prospective low-grade glioma. There are always exceptions. However, if there is a surgically accessible lesion that seems to be suspicious for a low-grade glioma, observation is probably not what the data suggests to us. Here's another study more recently with the same type of study design. Two groups followed in parallel, one with early resection, one with early biopsy, and the median survival difference is statistically quite clear. When it comes to operating on these patients, as Professor El Gandor alluded to, we have to balance the extent of resection with the quality of life. With respect to extensive resection, we are often asked by our patients and by their families, what is the benefit of being aggressive in the operating room? What is the benefit of a complete resection versus an incomplete resection? And there have been many studies that have identified this benefit, at least on the basis of retrospective data. And so here are three such studies that are larger in size that I'll show you the difference in five-year survival for a conventional WHO grade two glioma when you completely resect the tumor versus a subtotal resection, for example. So the difference is there and it is in our hands to make that difference provided that we can do it with the right level of technique and safety. For low-grade gliomas, however, it is not only about extent of resection to prevent recurrence of the tumor, but perhaps more importantly, it is also about extent of resection to prevent the malignant transformation of the tumor. So here is a study um, out of Europe that shows the relative difference in the rate of transformation when you completely resect a tumor, which is the line on the right, versus a subtotal resection, which is the line on the left. And this equates to about a tenfold risk of transformation. Now this should make a lot of sense to us because the, the fewer tumor cells are left behind, the more difficult it is for them to achieve a critical mass for transformation. So by operating early, by being aggressive under safe circumstances, we can not only prevent the tumor from coming back, and in, and in some cases, 
prevent it from ever coming back. But more importantly, we can slow down its progression towards transformation because as we know, most if not all low grades given enough time will become a high grade tumor. To the point of quality of life, quality of life certainly has a lot to do with neurological deficits, but for low grade glioma patients, quality of life also has a lot to do with seizure control. Seizures, as we know, are the most common presentation for low grade tumors. And therefore, if our operation is not controlling those seizures, then we have missed an opportunity in many cases. And here is work out of France from Johan Paloud demonstrating exactly that that with greater extent of resection, there is a commensurate decrease in seizure rates afterwards. So not only do you get the survival benefit, the malignant progression-free survival benefit, but perhaps just as importantly, you get a stepwise improvement in the angle class, the angle status, which as you know, is an indication of seizure control. And in this data, which came from our group, several years ago, the threshold for achieving that exceptional seizure control is about 80% or so volumetrically in low-grade tumors. So this is a major impact on the patient's quality of life, not only because of their ability to avoid seizures, but perhaps just as importantly, their ability to stay off of seizure medications. Of course, many of us um, are familiar with the work from Hugh Defoe um, and those within his school of thought with respect to aggressive supratotal resections of low-grade gliomas. And Hugh is, of course, the first to admit that this is a highly selected patient population where you are occasionally presented with patients that have tumors in low bar regions where you can truly go well beyond the flare in all dimensions. And this is what we term a supratotal resection. And to Professor El Gondor's point, in some of these circumstances, we may actually be curing these patients because we've gone so aggressively in a safe fashion, there simply isn't enough tumor burden afterwards for a recurrence in, in the duration of the patient's lifetime. So these are rare cases, of course, but opportunities that we should all take when we're presented it. Um, and obviously after a discussion with the patient and their family regarding the risks and benefits of being this aggressive. Generally speaking, however, what we do know is that there is a level of heterogeneity in the biology of these tumors. And that heterogeneity translates to heterogeneity in the clinical outcome of these patients. So we and others have for many years looked at whether molecular subtypes of gliomas impact their response to extent of resection. We know, for example, that there is a different pattern of recurrence with respect to extent of resection in hemispheric low-grade gliomas versus insular low-grade gliomas. And in fact, others have shown that there are patterns related to different molecular subtypes. One interesting finding is that for low-grade gliomas that are categorized as 1P19Q, so these are otherwise known as oligodendrogliomas, these are very slow-growing tumors. And in fact, it seems like some of the value of aggressive resection in these tumors is not so evident, perhaps because they're already so indolent that an aggressive resection doesn't, for example, seem to statistically change the rate of transformation. So what this tells us as surgeons is that we have to take into context not only the grade and the WHO status or categorization of the tumors we're operating on, but just as importantly, we have to understand the biology of these tumors to know which ones are gonna be more aggressive than a conventional grade two glioma and which ones are going to be less aggressive. And this is data uh, that really confirms data from our group and others that for grade two oligos, there is incrementally less advantage to aggressive resections compared to a grade two astrocytoma. It's not to say that we shouldn't be aggressive, 
It is just to say that we should understand that the value of our surgical efforts will be different from tumor to tumor. So for 1P19Q gliomas, we also know that uh, not only is there a relationship to extent of resection, but for all gliomas, there's a relationship to transformation. And so here we have a low-grade glioma resection probability map, which is something generated um, on the basis of patients in Europe from Montpellier, from Amsterdam, looking at grade two or early grade three tumors and demonstrating that depending on the location of the tumor, we can expect a different pattern or level of success in extended resection. And this is not a big surprise, of course, that tumors, for example, in the highly eloquent areas of the cortical spinal tracts or basal ganglia are less likely to be resected. But overall, it does emphasize to all of us the take-home messages for low-grade gliomas, which is that one, we should always favor early intervention in these cases. Two, that complete or near complete resections certainly provide a survival benefit to the patients, and that has to be balanced with the morbidity of those resections. Three, that these aggressive resections also confer an advantage to the transformation of these tumors and limits their ability to do that. And finally, that the tumor genetics increasingly are becoming an apparent factor in the response of a tumor to surgery. And so therefore, the more we understand how these genetics relate to extent of resection, the more we can tailor our approaches. Now, as was alluded to earlier, high-grade gliomas are a very different category of disease and patient population than low-grade gliomas. And again, we'll begin with the decision-making before we get to surgical approaches and techniques. There is very little in the form of level one randomized evidence demonstrating to us that resection versus biopsy give you a different outcome for high gliomas, but that data does exist. And this is a small scale study from older patients, median age 70, where they simply randomized 23 patients and demonstrated that there was in fact a very statistically significant survival benefit for craniotomy versus biopsy. Now that was a, that was a true uh, randomized controlled study powered or at least designed for survival analysis. Probably the best data we have to date is actually the ALA trial data from Walter Stumer and colleagues. This was a randomized study, of course, designed to look at the value of 5-aminolevulinic acid. However, it was a randomized control study for glioblastoma. And so as a consequence, we can still, and they still did to their credit, look at the survival data when patients were given ALA versus not, which effectively doubled the rate of gross total resection in these populations. And what we see very clearly is that there was a six-month progression-free survival benefit that doubled in these patients. And then later on, when the same group went back to look at their data in overall survival, there was a very clear five to six month benefit in overall survival with more aggressive resection. So this is probably the best data we have to date to really demonstrate beyond doubt that an aggressive operation in glioblastoma is not a futile endeavor. In fact, it is very valuable to patients under the right circumstances, and there have been a host of level three evidence retrospective studies that I've listed for you here that all effectively tell us that there is a benefit to gross total resection and to aggressive surgery for glioblastoma um, statistically and otherwise. Now we and others have asked a more nuanced question which is, yes, a complete resection is valuable to these patients, but to what extent is a subtotal resection valuable and where do you draw the line? How do you know that when you're encountering a glioblastoma patient, especially if it's a relatively diffuse lesion, whether you are getting enough to even have a benefit? And so what our data and others have shown, first when I was at San Francisco and then more recently in Phoenix at the Barrow, is that there is in fact a threshold for extent of resection and it, it is about 
a 78 to 80 percent threshold for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, meaning that if we as surgeons look at the imaging, look at the patient, and do not believe that volumetrically we can achieve 80 percent extent of resection, then we're better off biopsying this patient and moving them on to adjuvant therapy because our operation is not going to likely provide a meaningful survival benefit. So this is a good rule of thumb for surgeons as we select cases and patients to take on. Now others have looked at this same concept in other tumor types um, in using grade three gliomas and T2 weighted imaging rather than contrast enhancing imaging. Um, one group has alluded to a 53% threshold for the flare or the T2 of an anaplastic astrocytoma, meaning that if we can't get half of that out it's most likely not going to be associated with a survival benefit. Interestingly, there have been some studies suggesting that molecular subtyping is very starkly related to extent of resection. And this is work out of MD Anderson suggesting that only IDH1 mutant hygrogliomas benefit from a more aggressive resection. Meaning if you try to resect the flare in a glioblastoma, is it going to benefit the patient? And we're not talking about a super total resection. We're just talking about a conventional resection where some of the flare is removed, but not all of it. And the answer, at least in their data set, was that only in IDH mutant glioblastomas did you see benefit of flare resection. Now that data has yet to be completely validated. Um, so the jury is out. This is work more recently suggesting that in the question of flare resection for glioblastoma, it actually divides into two categories of tumors. One that they term as proliferation dominant, where as you can see, the contrast enhancement versus flare ratio is very high. And one they describe as diffusion dominant, where the contrast enhancement to flare ratio is very low. And the difference they postulate is that in the first category, the flare truly represents tumor infiltration predominantly. And in the second category, the flare represents more peritumoral cytotoxic edema. And consequently, in their data set, being aggressive resecting the flare and proliferation dominant tumors led to a survival benefit, but being aggressive in resecting flare in diffusion dominant tumors had no survival benefit. And this may be, I think, the most logical way to interpret flare imaging with respect to glioblastomas. Now, it does not mean that we should be setting out to resect flare in all cases. And as you can see in these cases, most likely some of that flare is occupying eloquent territories, but this is all about surgical planning. So for high grade gliomas, it's very clear that greater extent of resection at initial diagnosis improves overall survival, that 80% seems to be an extent of resection threshold for newly diagnosed glioblastoma. And we and others have published work demonstrating that for recurrent glioblastomas, the threshold is very similar. And finally, that the neurological morbidity that we incur during surgery is a factor. It's not just about quality of life. In fact, it's been shown by Alfredo Quinones and others, that neurological morbidity itself is a negative prognostic factor. If a patient wakes up with a significant deficit, they're not only gonna have a poor overall quality of life, but they're going to survive less as well. So let's talk in these final moments about the techniques that enable us to accomplish these decisions that we undertake. And I will divide them into two categories intraoperative techniques having to do with your surgical tasks and intraoperative technology. Most of the intraoperative techniques are really just about fundamental principles of neurosurgery. Employing natural subarachnoid planes to open up exposures. Carefully selecting the point at which you enter the brain in order to minimize morbidity. Positioning patients so that the position of the brain and the effects of gravity are being optimized to maximize your exposure. And of course, to um, echo the sentiments of our previous speaker, taking advantage of 
functional mapping, intraoperative stimulation mapping, and using functionally silent corridors to access tumors. Now, with respect to intraoperative technology, I'll touch upon three or four technologies that are more prevalent. Uh, these are not all technologies that I use every time, but nevertheless, it's important for us to be aware of them. Fluorescence-guided surgery, intraoperative MRI, intraoperative ultrasound, and intraoperative CT. Arachnoidal dissection is probably the most basic technique we all must learn in the course of our treatments, our training, and then in practice. For an a frontal or insular glioma like this, a transsylvian approach is a very reasonable approach in many cases. It's not always, in my opinion, the perfect approach, and so therefore you have to pick and choose your moments. But arachnoidal dissection, whether it is the sylvian fissure, the inner hemispheric fissure, or any other natural division in the brain, is easily exploited. And importantly, it's exploited without requiring fixed retraction. And you can see here that as I split this fissure and get into this frontal insular tumor, there is no retractor in the field. It simply just enables you to take advantage of what's already there for you and achieve complete resections without harming other cortical structures that are uninvolved. Now, with respect to improving extent of resection for specific subtypes of gliomas like insular gliomas, we and others have published on the comparison of a transsylvian versus a transcortical approach. And clearly for some tumors, including zone three insular gliomas, a transsylvian approach is superior. Entry point selection is very important in terms of minimizing morbidity. Here we have a grade one JPA in the posterior part of the thalamus called the pulvinar. We're approaching it through a lateral supracerebellar approach. We're coming underneath the tentorium, cutting the tentorium, going above the trochlear nerve, and then entering the pulvinar through the back. This is an eminently safe corridor to take and ultimately it enables you to completely resect lesions like this without any morbidity related to the thalamus. And importantly, without entering any peel margin other than the one directly over the tumor. So these are tricky locations to get to, but can be achieved very easily uh, through the right approach. Patient positioning is extremely important when it comes to inner hemispheric approaches in particular, but really for any case. the thalamic glioma, where we have one hemisphere down parallel to the ground and the other hemisphere up. This allows the inner hemispheric fissure to naturally open for you. You can see that there's no fixed retractors in this field. We're using lighted instruments to see down this deep corridor. You enter through the corpus callosum into the lateral ventricle. You see the bulge of the thalamus that's affected and you enter again directly into the peel margin overlying the tumor. This minimizes morbidity of the approach and certainly having the patient positioned in a lateral fashion where the hemisphere is dropping will give you the adequate exposure that you need in order to see down a quarter that is probably around eight or nine centimeters at its depth um, very easily and most importantly, very safely. So gravity retraction and patient positioning are really very important Anytime you are going down long corridors and you need to avoid things collapsing on your operative field. So here's a, uh, you know, a, an eloquent tumor in the non-dominant hemisphere. This is a patient that presents with hemiparesis. The tractography tells us that there are probably some tracts lateral to the tumor, but there are also probably some tracts medial that the tractography is not detecting. And DTI tractography is useful for planning, but it is not useful for making surgical decisions at a millimetric level. That's where intraoperative mapping comes in. So again, we've positioned the patient laterally. You see how the hemisphere just drops away from the falx without any retraction necessary. There's no lumbar drain or anything like that. And we're coming contralateral inner hemisphere. So that is the left hemisphere on the downside of the screen. We cut the faults like a trap door, which is a very simple, quick thing to do. And we begin the intraoperative asleep motor mapping in this case to identify the corridor 
that's safe to enter. And we see here that there is one region of the medial cortex that's functional and one media region that is non-functional. We enter this non-functional corridor. You can see that we have direct line of sight. You can see that the exposure is very adequate in the absence of any retractor, simply because we've positioned the patient to optimize our ability to mobilize that contralateral hemisphere as we get to the right hemisphere itself. Ultimately, this lets you get directly to the lesion and completely resect it. You can use your stimulation mapping on the backside of the tumor to identify the pathways descending on the left hemisphere medial to the, or lateral to the tumor. I don't really need to spend too much time on intraoperative mapping after this last talk we had. I would simply just add that uh, the data is quite clear that intraoperative mapping improves outcome. And the, the best study that I think emphasizes this is this meta-analysis from Philip DeWitt, where we see very clearly that when you deploy mapping in thousands of patients, you not only improve the extent of resection, but you also improve the deficits related to that extent of resection. And this is really what it's all about in our, in our world of glioma surgery, maximizing extent of resection while minimizing deficit. Now, when it comes to using intraoperative stimulation mapping, there's a variety of techniques available, of course, awake versus asleep. But perhaps just as importantly is understanding the patterns in which you deploy the mapping corridors. So here you have two lesions in comparable locations, one's a little lower than the other. In one lesion, the functional pathways are such that you really are gonna go circumferentially around the lesion, in another lesion, you're going to create a series of windows to really sidestep these functional corridors that are overlying the lesion. So sometimes an on-block approach is appropriate, and other times what we call a windowing approach, which is a term that Dr. Dr. Berger at UCSF initially introduced as a way of creating different corridors through non-functional tissue to access a common target beneath the surface. Moving on to the technologies that we have to improve our extent of resection, of course, fluorescence-guided surgery is, has been uh, very much increasing in utilization in, in Europe, in Asia, across the world, and most recently in the US. For high-grade gliomas, it's quite evident how you use this technology. And I think that at this point, it's as useful as any other standard of care adjunct in the operating room. For low-grade gliomas, we and others are developing technology to help you visualize the fluorescence because fluorescence does exist in lower gliomas. It's just that it is not visible to our eye because the concentration of protoporphyrin 9, which is the byproduct of 5-ALA that is fluorescent, is not high enough in lower gliomas to be seen through a light microscope. So we and others have developed handheld microscopes like this handheld confocal that help you visualize low-grade glioma fluorescence at a microscopic level. Intraoperative MRI is something that I think was increasingly popular perhaps 10 or 15 years ago, but less so today. Nevertheless, there is some role for it, I think, particularly in cases of large tumors where you're expecting a lot of brain shift in a prolonged case. So I'm really thinking about giant low-grade gliomas and things where the navigation and perhaps the anatomical reference points won't be as obvious towards the end of the case. And there has clearly been efforts to generate data demonstrating value to intraoperative MRI uh, associated with better extent of resection and a lower likelihood of uh, having postoperative residual tumor. That being said, I think we can all recognize that these these values have to be balanced against the cost of the device, as well as the time that it adds to the operation. So I can tell you that at the Barrow, we do have an intraoperative MRI, uh, but it, it has been quite some time since I've used it myself. Intraoperative ultrasound, however, I think is a more intriguing technology, not only because of its accessibility and low cost profile, but also just because of the ease of use in, with appropriate training. And the ultrasound devices today are very different from what they were 10 or 20 years ago. Here you can see 
3D ultrasound with a handheld device, you can see the lenticulostrites on the medial aspect of this insular glioma. And then intraoperatively, as the glioma has been resected, you can visualize how close you are to these lenticulostrites simply using this intraoperative ultrasound. So I think this is a very important modality that has perhaps been underemphasized in training programs today, but has value for any neurosurgeon uh, interested in identifying critical vascular structures. Most recently, I've seen some reports and some centers re-emerge with intraoperative CT. Now, naturally, intraoperative CT has some significant limitations when it comes to the image quality, but there are circumstances in which it can be valuable, especially if you have a calcified tumor or tumors where the CT quality of the image is, allows you to recognize where the tumor is and is not. And here you have an example from a recent publication. Here you have another lesion which is evident on intraoperative CT, and you could see the subtotal resection that was accomplished um, halfway through this operation in this publication. Uh, this is not a technology that I've used myself, but I do think that with the increasing em emphasis on cost efficiency, as well as time efficiency, there may be a role for this type of technology. So on balance, glioma extent of resection really comes down to decision-making first, favoring early intervention, but balancing that intervention against the risk of morbidity, understanding that in low-grade gliomas, there is a transformation rate that we're trying to control in addition to recurrence rates, understanding that in high-grade gliomas, there is a minimum threshold that we need to accomplish in order to have a survival benefit on these patients at initial diagnosis and at recurrence. And then finally, using all of the techniques and technologies that are available to us to achieve all of these goals safely and, and repeatedly with high consistency and high quality. So with that, I will thank you, um, the Asian Congress, um, for your time and attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nader, for this uh, very important uh, presentation. It was very illustrative. It was very comprehensive. We learned a lot from your presentation, and now, as we can see that there is change in the rationale of treatment of intracranial gliomas. Uh, and now, as we understand from your presentation, that we should go in the way of trying to maximize resection, surgical resection, as much as we can for both low-grade gliomas and high-grade gliomas for late for low-grade gliomas, uh, if we increase or maximize the extent of surgical resection, this will improve the survival, and we will decrease the incidence of malignant transformation, and that's very important. And uh, concerning high-grade glioma, if we are successful to increase or maximize the extent of resection, this will increase the survival, and it will increase the response to adjuvant therapy like radiotherapy. And uh, it is very important uh, to use the new intraoperative tumor visualization techniques. And that's the new technology uh, in order to be able to maximize the extent of resection. We have to use this new technology, the fluorescein guided surgery, intraoperative magnetic resonance imaging, ultrasound, and intraoperative computed tomography, and of course, uh, the intraoperative cortical mapping, because when we say that we have the target uh, to maximize the extent of tumor resection, we have to stress about a very important point. We need to maximize the extent of safe surgical resection in order not to have any neurological deficits postoperatively. Thank you very much, Professor Nader. I think uh, we opened, I give, I give the microphone back to Raja in order to open discussion about uh, the two lectures. Thank you very much, Professor Nader. Yeah. That was a wonderful presentation and we learned a lot today about surgical resection of gliomas. I would like to open this webinar for discussion for this. Uh, at the onset, I would like to call out Professor Atul Goel, who is here with us. Professor Goel, would you like to give your comments? Yes, yes. Uh, 
Dr. Welcome. Raja. Thanks yeah. for joining. <laughs> Dr. Nadir, that was fantastic uh, presentation. You see the controversy about whether to resect low-grade gliomas or not to resect low-grade gliomas is now essentially done. And uh, you, you know, majority of the people who are involved in this kind of surgery, radical resection without any question and without any doubt is the best form of treatment and as you and Professor Berger and Professor Defau and all these people have, you know, given this message to the entire world, this message is going far and wide and quite deep and accepted. I just want to know, you see, you also talked about high-grade gliomas and all these things. About low-grade gliomas, you said about N-block resection and window resection. I want to know exactly what is what that means and what is the difference between these two kind of uh, strategies and when do you adopt these strategies and what are your, you know, when you are doing end block, then of course you don't need monitoring and you don't need other things except at the end of the surgery. So what, uh, what is your take on that? I want to know about what is your, uh, you know, how you decide when to do either of these kind of techniques. Nadir? Right, thank you. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with the confirmation of the tumor. As we all know, we're sometimes faced with, if we're just talking about low grades, for example, low grade tumors that um, occupy relatively non-eloquent area, areas superficially, but deep, there may be functional pathways medial to them. So in those cases, cortically, you don't need to create any windows. You can simply cortically go circumferentially around the lesion. And then on the deep side of the tumor, if there are eloquent pathways, you can perform your mapping there. But in other cases, we've all been faced with tumors that, for example, in the posterior frontal lobe are partially occupying or adjacent to cortically eloquent structures. And in those cases, we oftentimes need to create multiple windows to get down subcortically to the target. So for example, um, an example of this that I think Dr. Berger has published on um, in his experience are posterior insular tumors, where uh, he doesn't favor a transylvian approach, and, and I don't either, but he'll take a series of cortical windows through the frontal and temporal cortex down to the insula. Now, if you're talking about an anterior insular tumor, that approach really isn't necessary. You can split the fissure and basically on block resect the insula through the sylvian fissure without having to go through any cortical windows. So a lot of it comes down to what is the confirmation of the tumor we've been presented with? What is the extent of its infiltration? And how does that relate to the eloquent structures at the cortex versus the subcortex? You have some radiological guides to uh, do this? You know, I think the, ra the radiology paradigms differ by location. So for example, uh, in the temporal lobe, many times in the non-dominant hemisphere, you can perform a temporal lobectomy for a lower glioma, which is something that I'm planning to do, you know, a little bit later this morning. But on the non-dominant side, oftentimes we have to create a series of windows to preserve functional cortex in the temporal cortex while still resecting the lesion that's subcortical. Uh, so I think it depends on the lobe you're working with as well as the hemisphere. Okay. Thank you very much, Nadir. Best wishes to you and uh, looking forward to hearing more from you and of you, Nadir. Thank, Thank you, you very too. much. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Very much, Professor Atul Joel. We'd we'll go back to our first chair for if he has any comments, Professor Francis Casella. Um, yeah, I have a question for Professor Sanaim. It was a, a, a beautiful lecture. Uh, I wonder if you have experienced yourself or what's your perspective on, on the value of using neuromodulation to uh, improve the, the, the extent of resection low grade glioma. What I mean by that is the possibility that was a, a nice paper in JNS, I think a couple of years ago from a Spanish group. And now most recently, you do is also now wrote a couple of editorials on this area, the possibility to use cortical stimulation to induce 
neuroplasticity. And so basically to dislodge eloquent areas in order to uh, extend the, the resection. Uh, do you see a real future for this? Or, I mean, this is of course very, very like uh, anecdotal so far, but it looks like a fascinating field to explore. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, I agree with you, Francesco. I mean, it, it is it's fascinating, intriguing, but still um, incomplete in the evidence for it. I think when many of us reviewed that um, article, you know, it's pretty clear that this is a very select group of patients. And in the absence of a true control, it's very difficult to know if the intervention is actually precipitating plasticity. Um, that being said, I think from a neurophysiological standpoint, it's not a unbelievable hypothesis. It's just that I think most of us will recognize that if it is possible, just like with the anecdotes surrounding super total resections of low grades, it's all about case selection. First of all, you have to have patients that are going to be disease stable enough to, to withstand a long period of time uh, for that plasticity to come into focus. Uh, so uh, I think it's worth exploring. I don't think those papers were definitive. Um, I think the authors know that they need to increase the sample size, perhaps strengthen their controls. And then also there probably needs to be a little bit more fundamental biology done on you know, exactly what is the mechanism of this? How are we quote unquote precipitating the plasticity and are there better ways to do it in a, you know, outside of the ways that they were proposing? Yeah, and on the other hand, I think the, the possibility to use non-invasive technique like TMS would yeah. probably like to explore this further because the right. idea to treat like an epilepsy surgery is rather invasive for some people right. because it's not as robust uh, uh, for now. Now, the other question, which is probably a little more provocative, but you know, I, I've been talking with you before, and Mitch Berger for years, and then following their uh, extraordinary work, and we have Lorenzo Bello in Italy and Milan Strap and others. But uh, my feeling is that low-grade glioma surgery requires a very high level of expertise. I mean, this is this applies to everything in your surgery, in surgery in general, mm -hmm. but specifically when you're going for total or even subtotal resection, uh, this is not in the hands of many people. Yeah. Uh, so, and of course, you come from a school which is UCSF, which has a long tradition in that. And, and I've been watching uh, you in, in several uh, occasions. Uh, so there is no discussion on the results of, of uh, San Francisco or Montpellier or some few other centers. But my question is, should we consider to centralize surgery for low-grade gliomas? Because, you know, uh, if you uh, attempt to do this surgery without the necessary expertise, I mean, my impression is that probably both Mitch and you, when they use subcortical mapping, or you as well, you use it to confirm what is your rate in your mind, right? Many surgeons, in probably, including probably myself, I'm not, I don't do many low grade, do many, we, we have mainly see high grade gliomas in Verona, but sometimes you use mapping to get oriented and to look for the white matter tracts, which is a different perspective. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the idea of using subcortical mapping to get to the level where you start to get a deficit and then you know that this will be reversible and you have to stop. If you don't have that level of expertise, it can be very dangerous as yeah. a message also to pass to the young neurosurgeons. So I wonder now, what, to what extent of centralization is a big problem in your surgery, especially in big countries. But I just wonder now what, what's your, your uh, opinion on that? Well, naturally, I agree with you. I mean, for lower gliomas, these are younger patients, typically with fewer deficits. These tumors are typically larger than high-grade gliomas. And the benefit of surgery, you could argue, is more for a low-grade glioma than a high-grade glioma. So it's a unique opportunity. It shouldn't be squandered I think um, by surgeons and centers that see you know one or two a year. So I agree with you there. Volume of repetition matters, and particularly in this population where you really only have something to lose. Most of the patients I see with low grades don't even have symptoms. 
So all I can do is make them worse. To your comments about using stimulation mapping, yeah, I think if you see myself or anyone who uses it a lot, including yourself, I'm sure, use stimulation mapping techniques, it, it's not there to really confirm anatomy. It's there to really show us where the kind of margin is. And um, uh, typically for me, when I'm doing an awake or an asleep craniotomy, there's only one border of the tumor that really worries me. And so what I do is I go directly to that border first, and that's what I'm gonna map as I resect and map and resect and map and effectively get myself just to the precipice of that functional margin. And then the rest of it is anatomical neurosurgery in most cases. So um, I think that's how you should be using simulation mapping. It really shouldn't be, as you alluded to, you know, um, a, a, an anatomical reference set. Uh, you know, these, this isn't the days of Wilder Penfield and things like that. Um, you have to get right down to the point. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, one question that I would like to put across to our learned professor is like, uh, what is your take on uh, flare-based resection? That you showed one slide about flare-based resection, and uh, I just came across an article which is live on current operating neurosurgery, I guess, done by Francisco Serta. Actually, I didn't even know the term that flarectomy exists in the neurosurgical lexicon, and they have used the word flarectomy, and they have said that it is a better survival of predictor than GADO-based tumor removal. What is your take on that? Um, I think it's a natural evolution of everything uh, the other speakers have alluded to. You know, 20, 30 years ago, we were debating whether we should even operate. Uh, that debate, I think, largely has been settled. And now the question is, how far should we go? Um, that being said, resecting flare, I think, is a very... Um, tricky endeavor and has to be done with extreme caution. Flare uh, around a tumor doesn't necessarily imply tumor infiltration. And flare infiltration oftentimes goes very directly into functional pathways. So I think the jury is out in terms of when we should be resecting, you know, beyond the contrast enhancement and the glioblastoma. That being said, I think we all subscribe to the theory that if the tissue is non-functional on mapping, it's relatively safer to take. But whether there's an oncological benefit to the flare resection, I think still remains unclear. So I, I did present some early studies that have tried to look at this, but just remember that these are highly selected case series. It's all retrospective. Um, and even with that, some of the data has not borne out a survival benefit. So. When I approach a patient with a glioblastoma, I'm still looking at it primarily from the standpoint of contrast enhancement because that is the minimum goal of my operation. But the, the T2 signal around it is something that may factor into the resection, but it's not a primary objective of surgery for me. Thank you, thank you so much. Our uh, Chair Professor Nasser El Gandur has some questions, I think, Professor. Yes, sir. Thank you, Raja. Uh, Professor Nader, I have an important question about uh, chiasmal gliomas in children. Uh, actually, sometimes we see huge tumors in children, and, uh, and uh, we, we, we are operating with these patients. And I don't know, we need, we need to know your experience. And uh, I, I need to know two things. Uh, uh, what, what extent of surgical removal you can do in such lesions? Were you able to, how, how much you were able to, to, to excise from such lesions while preserving vision of these children? And the second question, what new technology usually you use? I was using long ago, Cavitron ultrasonic surgical aspirator at the same time with visual evoke potential. Is there, is there anything like new technology you are using while dealing with these patients. Thank you. Uh, obviously, these are patients that um, are in very difficult circumstances. And as surgeons, these are cases where I think we have to be very careful with respect to making matters worse rather than better. So a key determinant for me is 
chiasmal involvement. Um, certainly, if I see that there is um, the optic nerve involved, but it hasn't quite reached the chiasm, for example, I think there's an opportunity there to perhaps slow its spread or prevent it from entering the chiasm. The biology of these tumors are very, you know, they're interesting because they don't necessarily behave like conventional low-grade gliomas. Um, that being said, once the tumor has invaded the chiasm, I personally am much less aggressive in those cases because there's very little to gain from those operations. You can relieve mass effect, you can get a diagnosis, but it's more about adjuvant therapy in those cases. Um, with respect to the intraoperative adjuncts, I avoid ultrasonic aspiration um, in cases like that because of my concern uh, surrounding the, the adjuvant effects of the ultrasound to the rest of this eloquent tissue. So it's usually suction, um, avoiding ultra, uh, bipolar electrocautery, um, using blunt dissection. But adjuvant therapy wise, you know, obviously there are many technologies or platforms for radiotherapy and they have marginal benefit in those cases. Um, truly the, the hope should be that we develop adjuvant chemotherapies um, for this population because I, I fear that this is not as much of a surgical disease as we would like it to be. I think probably Francesco has more experience with it than I do, I would imagine. And, and so neither you, you like just to take biopsy and then adjuvant therapy and uh, are you able to give uh, adjuvant therapy like radiotherapy, you like to give that at such young age, like two years old sometimes? or even younger? So I, I think the, um, the extent of resection that is based a little bit on the features of the tumor. Some of these tumors are more exophytic and you can resect that exophytic component a little bit more safely. And as I mentioned, some of them are not involving the chiasm and I think there's a little bit more safety there. Um, so in some cases though, those are not the case. There's no real distinction between the nerve and the tumor or the chiasm and the tumor. And in those cases, I think a biopsy is, a, is an appropriate. Adjuvant therapy-wise, it's typically some form of fractionated radiotherapy. Um, you know, early age, at two years of age, it, it's um, challenging to do it. And I think in some of those patients, you simply have to watch and wait. Um, it is important to recognize that these tumors, even though they histologically may appear like grade two or grade three, they don't necessarily behave like a conventional grade two or three, and in some cases can be much more indolent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before we close down, I will take to one last question from my co-host, Dr. Liu Bun Seng. Thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you, Prof, for a nice presentation. I would like to ask you, Professor, regarding low-grade glioma in terms of malignant transformation. Do you think that malignant transformation or doubling time uh, is, is a fixed a parameter? It depends on the mitotic index of the tumor, or you think we'll be influenced by the extent of resection or number of surgery, or even adjuvant therapy. Uh, second question is, uh, when you ask, when you talk about low grade glioma, do you include grade one, WHO grade one? You, in your mind that WHO grade one glioma is totally different entity uh, because of the behavior and uh, the treatment strategy in those tumor. My last question to you, Professor, regarding uh, windowing technique uh, for low grade glioma. As we know, a glioma is a white matter disease. How much the gray matter preservation and cortical vasculature help you in terms of the recovery of the patient? Thank you, Professor. So your first question really asks about the distinction between doubling time um, or proliferative index and malignant transformation. So I really consider those to be two different parameters. The doubling time and the proliferative index is probably more indicative of the rate at which the tumor might recur or the rate at which it might progress. But the transformation rate, that's a real you know, genetic biological sort of uh, process. That has much to do with not only the genetics of the tumor, but I think the microenvironment of the tumor. And that's why surgery has a unique effect there. Because if you can imagine, if you have 10 to the sixth cells or 10 to the 10th cells, and they have an opportunity for transformation versus 10 to the second cells or 10 to the third or fourth cells, there's going to be a very, very different microenvironment for those two scenarios. And so as a consequence, I don't think the effect is linear, meaning that, you know, we don't have data for this yet, 
but a complete resection probably has a disproportionately positive effect on transformation rates than a near total resection. So I think transformation rate is a key indicator of success for a low-grade glioma. Uh, your second question had to do with, um, let's see, your third question was about grade one. Your second question was about windowing, was it? Uh, whether you- About you, cortical you, preservation? No, uh, when you talk about low-grade glioma, do you include uh -huh. grade, one, uh, yeah. grade one tumor or you think grade one is totally yeah. different entity? Uh, yeah, I don't consider grade one tumors to be part of a quote-unquote low-grade glioma discussion because those are surgically curable tumors. Uh, basically with a grade one tumor, if you know it's grade one, you need to do everything you can to get that tumor entirely out. Uh, even if the patient is uh, relatively intact, even if it's in a relatively eloquent location, these are cases where we tell our trainees, if you have a subtotal resection after surgery, you take the patient back and you complete the operation because it's a big, big difference for those patients. Um, your final question really had to do with cortical preservation um, and, and windowing versus on block resections. For, for gliomas in general and low grades in particular. So basically what it comes down to is what is the cortical involvement of this tumor? In many low grades, it's a purely subcortical phenomenon. And so your task is really to get to the subcortex as quickly and safely as possible. And that's where cortical windows come in. You don't need to expose a cortical exposure the size of a tumor in order to resect it. You just simply need a one centimeter window somewhere safe and work subcortically there. So cortical preservation is really important, but as many people have shown, the subcortical white matter pathways and the eloquence that you can compromise if you're not aware of where they are and you're not mapping them can be just as devastating. So for example, one of the most, I think, challenging tumors for a, a mapping case are tumors adjacent to the left atrium subcortically in the, in the dominant hemisphere. These are patients that can be truly devastated even if you don't have a lot of cortical transgression, if you're unclear or unable to map the subcortical white matter pathways that overlie the left atrium. So that would be one example of the importance of each. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. So I think Professor Takashi Khan wants to give one comment before we wind up. Professor Takashi Khan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanai. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Khan from Tokyo, Japan. I, I met, met you in um, 2019 in Hamamatsu, Japan, Japan uh, brain, brain tumor, tumor surgery meeting. Uh, I, I, I have only comments. Uh, no, no, no question. Um, um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, we, we use, use uh, we uh, use uh, 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 5LA and, 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 and uh, 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 mapping surgery, surgery. Uh, based on, based on the, the, uh, your, your paper, your paper are difference, are difference general, general surgery, surgery and 5LA uh, 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 many of many papers. papers. Uh, we, uh, we, sometimes, sometimes we cannot, we cannot accomplish, accomplish uh, total, total removal, total removal uh, uh, ideal uh, removal, removal, but uh, uh, I keep... I keep uh, um, uh, continuing, uh, continuing. So, uh, the, uh, the maximum, maximum resection, resection and, and uh, achieve, achieve your best. best. Uh, uh, I keep, I keep on studying, studying and based, based, based on, on your uh, papers and based on your uh, uh, institute's uh, papers. papers. So, um, so, so thank, thank you uh, for a very informative lecture today. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Joining us. So we'll go back to our chairs, Professor Al-Gandur, who says concluding remarks, Professor Al-Gandur. Thank you very much, Raja. At the end of this session, I would like to thank you for invitation to thank our speakers, Professor Nader Sanai and uh, and uh, and uh, Professor Sala, and uh, and for the first lecture, uh, it was uh, really a wonderful session, uh, and we enjoyed the, the talks. Uh, and I don't have any comments, uh, but I hope to see you all again. We are organizing webinars, and we can collaborate in the future. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor. Professor Salah, would you like to say your concluding remarks? Well, I think that everything has already said. <laughs> no, thank you. It was a, a very nice webinar. I enjoyed it very much. And I hope to have the opportunity to join you in, on more occasions in the future. So thanks again for inviting me and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll wind this officially, but before that, I would like to tell all our viewers that today we had 1,550 audience who viewed this live across the globe on different platforms like Zoom, YouTube, and WeChat. Thank you so much all the, for the wonderful support that uh, all the people are giving to the ACNS webinars. So <clears throat> on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yukukat, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Otone Endo and Chair Professor Francisco Sella, and also the second spe speaker, Professor Nader Sanai and the Chair Professor Nasser El Gandur for coming here, taking that time and teaching us, us elaborately about their subspecialties. Thank you so much, everybody. Two names I cannot forget is one of Professor Michael Lawton, who readily agreed to partner with us uh, and suggesting some wonderful names like Professor Nader Sanai for our webinars. And the second person, Professor Shubin, who arranged the broadcast for this in WeChat China, where we have more than 1,000 viewers. Thank you so much, everybody. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia, special thanks to you for joining me today. So until we meet on next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us.